from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the 14th Librarian of Congress, Dr. Carla Hayden. Uh, uh, thank you. Good evening, and welcome to the 2017 National Book Festival Gala Celebration, the opening of the festival. It is my great honor to be part of the institution that organizes and presents this wonderful public event. Every year, for 17 years, the Library of Congress has brought the nation's greatest authors, poets, and illustrators to the nation's capital and put them together with book lovers who come from as far away as North Carolina and Michigan to hear them talk about their work. Everyone here tonight is part of that extraordinary effort and I thank you for joining us this year. I want to say a few words about a number of people who can't be with us here because of the de devastating floods in Texas. Children's author, Tim Tingle, whose house was in the hurricane's path. And our interviewers, Kevin Sullivan and Mary Jordan, who were in the very thick of things getting the news out for the Washington Post. Our thoughts are with them and with all who have been affected. Now you would not be here if you did not love books. And we wouldn't be here if the United States Congress did not love books. The members of Congress are the benefactors and overseers of this library, the largest cultural institution in the world, and we thank those members who are with us today. We have a number of diplomats in the audience who are also book lovers, too. Welcome to the ambassadors of Peru, India, Latvia, Latvia, and also the Cultural Counselor of Mexico. And thank you to the Mexican Cultural Institute, the Embassy of Colombia, the Embassy of Ireland, and the Embassy of Sweden for helping us bring superb talent from your countries to our shores. Our audience tonight also includes the many sponsors who have contributed to making this event possible. Mr. David Rubenstein, the festival's co-chair. <laughs> Charter sponsors, the Institute of Museum and Library Sci Services, IMLS, the Washington Post, and Wells Fargo. You may clap. <laughs> and also, patrons and contributors, the James Madison Council of the Library of Congress, the National Endowment for the Arts, the National Endowment of the Humanities, Scholastic Inc., and many others. Because of their generosity, the festival remains completely free. And thank you for that. And there's more. There are more than a thousand volunteers who give of their time. Libraries of Congress staff, the general public, the Junior League of Washington, and our introducers from the Washington Post, National Public Radio, and numerous other media organizations. And speaking of library staff, a team of more than a dozen have worked on planning tomorrow's event which will offer the most impressive lineup of authors in the 17-year history of the festival. And so I'd like to especially acknowledge our festival organizers, director Jared McNeil and literary director Maria Arana. And of course, a big thank you to Sue Siegel of our development office. Now, the lively image you see 
here is from our festival poster. And it was designed by the delightfully talented artist, Roz Chess. And she wanted to convey the idea, one that we all recognize and know, that books are fun and they're shared experiences at once personal and communal. Books ask questions and they aspire answers. They are essential to the human experience and they open us to possibilities we might otherwise never see. Our theme tonight is the American story. And I can't think of a better subject to relay the energy and diversity that all of the storytellers here tonight and at the festival will bring. In fact, I must take a moment to recognize some of our newest and youngest contributors to the American story. We have with us tonight the newly pinned and recognized 2017 National Student Poets. Would you please stand up? These five young people. <laughs> These five young people will be spending the next year bringing words and the magic of words to young people throughout the country. They represent the five regions of the country and they are, I think, the embodiment of what this festival is about. One of the great traditions of the festival has always been to bestow the Library of Congress Prize for American Fiction on Festival Day. This year's winner, Dennis Johnson, to whom I offered the prize in March of this year, died tragically a few months later in May. We are honoring this great figure in contemporary American literature tomorrow with a posthumous conferral of the prize. It will be presented at the very top of our fiction stage and relayed to his widow, Cindy Johnson, along with the citations about Dennis, we have gathered from more than a dozen literary figures from around the world. And since we always feature our winner at this gala evening, we offer you now a very brief video on the life and work of Dennis Johnson. English words are like prisms, empty, nothing inside, and still they make rainbows. So says a character in Already Dead, a novel by the late, great American writer Dennis Johnson. Johnson's stories, as legions of his fans know, are also prisms. They are hard, merciless, flinty, and yet they too make rainbows. He's been called a writer's writer's writer, and for all the enigma of that string of words, they hold a simple truth. Those who bring language to life recognize Johnson's gifts instantly. Louise Erdrich calls his work profound and transcendent. Jonathan Franzen finds his sentences miracles of transparency and tone. Philip Roth calls him daring, terrifying, and an emissary for tortured, broken souls. Marilyn Robinson marvels that a writer's personal passions and energies can be so inextricably wedded to his words. All agree, Dennis Johnson has managed to give us minimalist, yet distinctly ecstatic and hallucinatory rainbow prose. He is an American original. He was born in 1949 in Munich, Germany, and raised in Tokyo and Manila, the child of American diplomats. As a teenager, moving back to Washington, D.C. during the tumultuous 60s, he came to know the country and the restless characters he would capture so vividly in his fiction. He graduated in English literature from the University of Iowa and earned an MFA from the Iowa Writers' Workshop, where he returned as a teacher. He has also taught at Texas State University and the University of Texas at Austin. In the course of his fevered career, he published novels, short stories, journalism, and poetry. Among his best-known works are those about the flotsam and jetsam of American life, The Laughing Monsters, Nobody Move, Tree of Smoke, Already Dead, 
Jesus' son, resuscitation of a hanged man, the stars at noon, Fiscadoro, angels. He's received numerous awards for these, including a National Book Award, a Lannan Fellowship in Fiction, a Whiting Writers Award, and in 2008, he was named a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize. Throughout, he has chronicled an America that has gone unobserved, unrecorded. Here are our drug addicts, our war veterans, our disaffected, our used up and left behind. And yet the most affecting and rewarding aspect of Dennis Johnson's fiction is that in work after work, he has proved that beauty often lurks in unexpected places, that strength can be found in failure, that the human spirit is a fragile but resilient vessel. His is a very American story. He once described his works as pressure cookers of language, his characters as those who inhabit life's perilous edge. As time wore on, he found that he himself was all too vulnerable to these human frailties. When the Librarian of Congress, Carla Hayden, offered Dennis Johnson the Library of Congress Prize for American Fiction in March of 2017, he wrote in an email message, my head is spinning from such great news. Two months later, tragically, he was dead. The library is very proud to honor posthumously this extraordinary human being and writer whose contributions to the American canon have been lasting and invaluable. As the librarian wrote when the prize was announced in June 2017, Dennis Johnson was a writer for our times. In prose that fused grace with grit, he spun tale after tale about our walking wounded, the demons that haunt, the salvation we seek. We emerge from his imagined world with profound empathy, a different perspective, a little changed. We're very proud to count Dennis Johnson among the distinguished winners of the Library of Congress Prize for American Fiction. Thank you. The National Book Festival is not only a celebration of books and reading, but also of literacy itself. Life in these demanding times can be very difficult for those who have never learned to read. And unfortunately, there are too many people in that number in this country and around the world. The latest estimate is that 65% of adults in the world are functionally illiterate. At the library, it is an important part of our mission to com combat illiteracy and promote a culture of reading. And one of the most generous supporters of American culture, history, and the arts in this country is Mr. David Rubenstein, co-chair of the National Book Festival and its primary donor. His patriotic philanthropy can be seen all across Washington at the Kennedy Center, the National Zoo, the Washington Monument, and at the new National Museum of African American History and Culture. But his work can also be seen all across the country and the world. He is a tireless promoter of literacy, and he believes in books, libraries, and the opportunity and success that are intrinsically linked. And I trust they are for all of us here tonight. His dedication to increasing literacy across the world led to his creation and support of the Library of Congress Literacy Awards. And I now invite you to watch another video we have prepared about the Literacy Awards and David's involvement in them. People who can read, and do, are healthier, happier, and live longer than people who can't. They are more likely to get preventative health care and less likely to go to an emergency room. Women and girls who are educated have fewer children, and those they do have are twice as likely to survive. Everyone benefits from literacy. For every 1% increase in a country's literacy rate, 
there is a permanent 1.5% increase in its gross domestic product. But illiteracy is widespread. Worldwide, 758 million adults, most of them women, cannot read or write a simple sentence. Illiteracy contributes to poverty and crime. 43% of adults with the lowest literacy levels live in poverty. 70% of adult welfare recipients have trouble reading. 75% of state prison inmates did not complete high school. Illiteracy is expensive. Low literacy levels cost the U.S. $225 billion each year in lost workforce productivity, crime, and unemployment. And illiteracy costs the global economy $1.19 trillion each year. Launched with the creative vision and generosity of David M. Rubenstein, the Library of Congress Literacy Awards recognize and promote the achievements of organizations whose innovative, research-based practices are improving literacy worldwide. Since 2013, these awards have provided more than $1 million to 77 institutions in 24 countries. This year, a committee of literacy experts evaluated 59 nominations and presented their findings to the Librarian of Congress, who selected winners in three categories. The $50,000 International Prize recognizes significant and measurable contributions to increasing literacy levels by an organization based outside the United States. The $50,000 American Prize recognizes significant and measurable contributions to increasing literacy levels on a national level. The $150,000 David M. Rubenstein Prize recognizes a domestic or international organization that has demonstrated exceptional and sustained depth in its commitment to the advancement of literacy. Please join Librarian of Congress Carla Hayden and Literacy Awards founder David M. Rubenstein in recognizing the achievements and innovations of the three organizations selected as winners of the 2017 Library of Congress Literacy Awards. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome David M. Rubenstein, co-chairman of the National Book Festival and the originator and sponsor of the Library of Congress Liter Literacy Awards. Um, Carla, thank you very much for your kind words and thank you for your dedication to the National Book Festival and the cause of literacy. Um, we are thrilled that you are the Library of Congress. I'm particularly thrilled that you came here from Baltimore, my hometown where you headed the library for some 20 years there. It's hard to believe, you, you saw that film, that uh, it's not just a global problem, it's an American problem. 45 million Americans are functionally illiterate, 45 million. We have about 330 million Americans, 45 million are functionally illiterate, which means that they can't read beyond a fifth grade level. If you can't read beyond a fifth grade level, your chance of having an economic success in life is reduced dramatically. Uh, people who don't have the ability to read earn, on average, 40% less than people who can read. And that is a real tragic situation. In our country, we talk about the income gap and the growing income gap, but it's really a growing literacy gap. And the income gap is directly related to the literacy gap. Unless we can do something about closing the literacy gap, we have no chance of closing the income gap. We also have no chance of dealing with some of the side effects of literacy that were mentioned. For example, if you are illiterate, functionally illiterate, your chance of being a juvenile delinquent is dramatically increased. In fact, 85% of all juvenile delinquents are functionally illiterate. And as those statistics showed, roughly two-thirds of people who are in our prison system are functionally illiterate. It's a sad situation, and we have not made as much progress as we should. Uh, think about this in your case. Suppose in your case, everybody here, I presume, is literate. I hope everybody is. 
but suppose you couldn't read. Think about your life. How would your life be different if you couldn't read? You've gone through your entire life and you couldn't read. Not only would you probably be more likely to be part of our criminal justice system, not only would you likely have a much lower income for your family, but you, the pleasure that you get from reading would be gone. To me, one of the great pleasures of my life is reading. And I just can't imagine my life without the ability to read. But think about your own lives. How would your life be so different if you couldn't read? That's the problem we have with some 45 million Americans, and it's growing. And let me just mention one other problem. Not just illiteracy, as great as that problem is, but the problem of illiteracy. There are people who can read, but don't read. It's hard to believe, but 31% of American males last year who are literate did not read a single book. In fact, 26% of all Americans who can read didn't read a book at all last year. And 40% of all high school graduates who can read did not read a book at all last year. Now, as we all know, reading is very important, but reading books is a special pleasure. And the National Book Festival emphasizes not just literacy, but the value of books and the importance of reading and books. And so I hope all of you, when you leave here tonight, and when you finish the book festival tomorrow for those who are going, think about how privileged you are to be able to read and how sad your life will be if you couldn't read. And so all of us should be th thrilled with our parents, our teachers who taught us how to read, and we should really be sad that we have so many people in this country who can't get the pleasure out of reading that all of us have. So to the extent that you can think about one thing you might be able to do after you leave the festival, it is, I hope, something you might be able to do to contribute to somebody with your time, your energy, ideas, your money, to help support the effort to eradicate and dramatically reduce illiteracy and hopefully reduce and eradically and, and dramatically reduce, reduce um, illiteracy. It's a tragic situation that we have to all deal with. And again, the income gap in this country is not going away until the literacy gap goes away. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, the winner of the 2017 International Prize of the Library of Congress Literacy Awards is Pratham Books, creator of Storyweaver, an online digital repository that offers stories in mother tongue languages free of charge to children in India. Accepting the award for Pratham Books is Chairperson Ms. Suzanne Singh. Ladies and gentlemen, the winner of the 2017 American Prize of the Library of Congress Literacy Awards is the National Center for Families Learning, which works with community partners to develop model programs and innovative laboratories that advance family literacy. Accepting the award for the National Center for Families Learning is President and Founder, Ms. Sharon Darling. Ladies and gentlemen, the winner of the 2017 David M. Rubenstein Prize of the Library of Congress Literacy Awards is the Children's Literary Initiative, which delivers content-focused coaching to educators who work in under-resourced schools with lagging literacy achievement, equipping them with high-impact strategies and techniques for literacy instruction, and providing their classrooms with high-quality children's literature. Accepting the award for the Children's Literacy Initiative is Chief Executive Officer, Dr. Joel Zero. And David, and thank you to all the winners, but we have something for you. Uh -oh. 
it's okay. We'd like to present you with a token of our appreciation for all you have done to make the Literacy Awards and the National Book Festival a success. So here is a specially framed facsimile of the Book Lovers Map of the United States. And you'll see that it has portraits of great American writers, including Ralph Wim Waldo Emerson, Nathaniel Hawthorne, and Edgar Allan Poe, Baltimore. <laughs> Walt Whitman and Mark Twain and all the places they're from. Well, but thank, thank you, David. Well, thank you very really. much. Thank you. <laughs> well, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. And now, ladies and gentlemen, our terrific lineup of authors will give us their views on what the American story means to them. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Margot Lee Shetterly. Uh, it is such an honor for me to be here in a room full of writers, so many of my literary heroes here tonight. America may be the only country in the world founded by a bunch of writers. Jefferson, Hamilton, Madison, Franklin, their prose and their lucid ideas about the nature of humanity and freedom is some of the most admired and influential writing in the history of the world. America is essentially a work of imagination, so it's no surprise that we, its citizens, devote so much of our lives to pursuing an American dream and to telling an American story. Growing up in Virginia in the 1970s and 80s, however, I could never seem to find my story in American history. I remember elementary school and junior high school and dreading those few days when the social studies curriculum turned its eyes to black history. There was slavery and Martin Luther King, and that was about it. Black history in the classroom was always a discussion of racial, racial violence and disenfranchisement and shame. The idea that simply by virtue of the color of their skin, my forebears were considered legally, socially, and economically less than full citizens of this country and less than fully human. The textbooks offered cursory information about the state of blacks in America, but virtually nothing about black Americans as individuals who, as I knew firsthand, were as engaged in the pursuit of life, liberty, and happiness as any other citizen of our country. Where were the stories of the protagonists? I grew up in a world where robust families and members of a dynamic community dreamed of a better future, and they found ways great and small to fight against injustice. They did all they could to help people do their best work, whether that work was cleaning other people's houses, as my grandmother did, or calculating orbit orbital trajectories, as did the women that I write about in Hidden Figures. Where in those history books were, for example, the business people who pooled their resources to provide mortgages to black homeowners, or the teachers, like my mother, or the scientists, like my father? Well, there was the chemist George Washington Carver, and he was the black scientist that everybody heard about during class, and they had that poor guy working overtime during <laughs> Black History Month. In general, however, I could not square the textbook's narrow and degraded presentation of the past with my present, and I certainly had problems attaching that past to my future. I was an ambitious handful of a whippersnapper, ready to take on the world, and as far as I was concerned, history was simply ballast. It was something meant to be offloaded if I was going to be able to rise and pursue my version of the American dream. So it's no surprise that when I graduated from the University of Virginia, I chose a career that seemed to me the perfect opposite of history, investment banking. <laughs> but as hard as I tried, I simply could not outrun the history. After decades of living and working outside of Virginia, and in fact, outside of the United States, I recently moved to Charlottesville, Virginia. So today, not only am I working as a writer and a historian, I am living history in a way that is terrifying and fascinating and that I never thought would occur in my lifetime. 
The recent white supremacist march happened on the grounds of the school where I spent four years of my life. The counter-protests and the attack took place in downtown Charlottesville. The Confederate statues that ignited the firestorm are a 20-minute walk from where I currently live. Now, there's been a lot of talk around Charlottesville and around the country about how what happened there three weeks ago doesn't represent Charlottesville or America as we currently believe it to be. I love my country passionately. I love my native state, and I love my adopted city. But I also know the painful history and what happened on August 12th. That too is Charlottesville and America. It's an America that has battled the better angels of our nature from the very beginning. For example, from the 1930s through the 1950s, my alma mater and other Virginia universities paid qualified black students to attend graduate school out of state rather than to allow them to continue their educations at home in Virginia. Virginia closed its schools rather than complying with the Supreme Court's Brown versus Board of Education decision and allowing the blacks of the hidden figures generation to learn alongside whites. And that was nearly a century after the end of the Civil War. My father is a retired NASA scientist. His name is Robert Lee, and his family roots are in Westmoreland County, Virginia, which also happens to be the birthplace of the Confederate General Robert E. Lee. America is about both the slavery and racial terror associated with the Confederate monuments, and it is also about those beautiful revolutionary ideals of progress and freedom that were written into existence by our founding documents. But it's also about so very much more. As James Baldwin said, American history is longer, larger, more various, more beautiful, and more terrible than anything anyone has ever said about it. I believe that one of the reasons why the push to remove these statues is so strong right now is because the statues symbolize not just the presence of the racial apartheid that marks our history, but it also signals an absence, the absence of tales of people who lived not just black lives, but American lives. People who pushed our country to live up to its founding ideals, not in spite of their history, but because of it. That absence has created a powerful vacuum, one that is urgently trying to absorb the stories of people like Dorothy Vaughn, Mary Jackson, Katherine Johnson, and Christine Darden, the women that I write about in Hidden Figures. Hidden Figures is a black story, and it's a Virginian story. It's a women's story, and it's a mathematician's story. But most fundamentally, it is an American story. In the time since my classroom days, I've come to understand that learning history isn't just an encounter with oppression or with pain. It's a necessary condition for progress and for social change. And now I know that storytelling, that most human of activities, storytelling determines both the meaning of our past and also the trajectory of our future. No one knew that better than our founding writers. They wrote our country into existence. And for those of us whose history here began with a bill of sale, not the bill of rights, it is our job to be the protagonists of our own stories and to write our lives into the great epic of America. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Scott Turow. Tough act to follow. <laughs> I'm going to start off script for one second uh, because I was lucky enough to be at the first National Book Festival I've returned from time to time, and it is certainly my favorite event of its kind, and that is for two reasons. One uh, is because, uh, to me, writers remain the true 
rock stars, and I love being able to breathe uh, the same air as, the, as so many great writers as are going to be here um, this weekend uh, and are here tonight. And secondly, if you think about it, uh, this is the only official national celebration that we have of books and authors and readers. And it's a great thing that we do that. So I need to thank uh, the Library of Congress, Dr. Hayden, uh, David Rubenstein, who's had his shoulder to the wheel for several years now, Maria Rana, everybody else who uh, has labored to bring this weekend into being because it really is a peak moment for the American literary community. Uh, anyway, now, of course, I will talk about myself. Um, <laughs> As a kid, I watched too much TV. That, at least, was the opinion of my aunt and uncle from California, which they expressed tirelessly to my mother whenever they came to stay with us in Chicago. The one-eyed monster, as my aunt called it, was going to gnaw through my brains, dull me permanently, and prevent me from reading. Uh, much to my dismay, my mother took their warning seriously because both of my aunt, both my aunt and uncle were, yes, psychoanalysts, which to my mother made them truth tellers on the level of oracles. Um, I do have to add that that did not prevent my mother uh, years later when my aunt and uncle finally had a family of their own, didn't prevent my mom from occasionally observing to them how much easier it was to give other people high-minded advice about their children <laughs> rather than follow it with their own. Uh, more important, my aunt and uncle, much as I adored each of them, it somewhat missed the point. Yes, I wheedled my way in front of the TV and spent hours there in a trance state, but I read a great deal too. I was, in fact, one of those kids recklessly absorbed with fantasies, novels, TVs, movies, and above all, the stories running in my own brain. I was, I guess, accommodating reality only in very small doses. Uh, if I were my own psychoanalyst required to explain this, I would highlight the stark fears and vulnerability I felt in a household dominated by my father, a man of harsh and mercurial temper. But whatever the reason, certain TV shows felt as essential to my well-being as food and water. Uh, like so many others, I worshipped Superman, defender, to quote the prologue of the show, of quote, truth, justice, and the American way. Uh, a little less typically, I also couldn't wait to see Mighty Mouse on Saturday mornings, probably because at some level I equated him with a child with superpowers. Um, also, by the time I was nine or ten, I made sure to save an hour of my limited TV time, thanks to my aunt and uncle, uh, for Perry Mason on Saturday night. Perry always discovered the truth and made sure that power was used fairly so that the guilty were punished and the innocent freed. As passionately as I gave myself to these American stories, I began to notice a problem as I got older. They were not true, meaning they did not offer the clues about surviving in the world which I apparently expected from them. It is, of course, a given of every childhood to learn there are no Santa Clauses or superheroes. But in real life, I realized there couldn't even be a Perry Mason. Uh, in time, I grew savvy enough to realize that Hamilton Berger, the hapless district attorney, couldn't possibly have kept his job if every week he lost to Perry Mason. <laughs> this struggle between hope and reality, child and adult, led to an internal dialogue that went on inside me for many years which I ultimately ended up incorporating in my second novel, The Burden of Proof. My hero, the defense lawyer, Sandy Stern, I, an, my own answer, I suppose, to Perry Mason, is long past his child-rearing years when Stern unexpectedly finds himself babysitting for Sam, a precocious five-year-old who sits down in Stern's lap as they study the night sky. Sandy, Sam said suddenly, does good always win? 
Stern nearly asked what Sam was referring to, but restrained himself with the thought that it was unseemly to be evasive with a five-year-old. No, Stern said finally, not always. It does on TV, the boy said. This was offered in part as refutation. Well, it should win, said Stern. That is what television is showing you. Why doesn't it win? It does not always lose. It wins often, but it does not win every time. Why not? Sometimes the other side is stronger. Sometimes both sides are good in part. Sometimes neither, Stern thought. How much does good win, Sam asked. A lot? A lot, said Stern. He had meant to answer as often as it loses, but he felt this was inappropriate and perhaps not even correct. There was no place for brutal honesty with a child. The questions implicit in this conversation have been the obsessions of my adult years, deciding what is good in the first place and defining the circumstances in which it is entitled to triumph, how to deal fairly with the bad, and how to survive as a human when those efforts founder. They were, I realize now, the themes I was writing about when I made my first serious efforts at fiction in college, and they remained my core emotional concerns and drove me from academic life to law school in my late, 19, in my late 20s. Furthermore, like all of my beloved fellow writers at this wonderful festival, I have had the extraordinary good fortune of finding out that these questions and the stories I have written about them preoccupy not only me, but many other Americans. No surprise, really. De Tocqueville told us that from the start, the law has been the binding fabric of America. That is because we are not simply a country, a group of people drawn together by the common places of geography or even language. Our fellowship in the United States is based on a larger mutual adherence to certain central ideas that government must be subordinate to law and what I've always regarded as the greatest American ideal of all, the one that Thomas Jefferson and his co-authors borrowed from John Locke, namely that all persons are created equal. Our biggest idea is that government must treat every citizen with the same concern and respect and guarantee to each citizen an equal voice in the governance of the nation we have formed together. So my story, as I understand it, is part of that much larger story, the one we tell together every day and the one that we must always strive to make ever truer. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Reshma Saujani. Thank you so much. It's a, it's a huge honor to be here today. So when I think about American story, I think about one word, opportunity. I am first and foremost the daughter of refugees. My parents came here in the 1970s after being expelled by the dictator Idi Amin in Uganda. They were lucky for one reason and one reason alone. Both of my parents were engineers and this country in the 1970s was desperately seeking engineers. So my parents became two of a thousand refugees who got status to come to this country. And even though they were engineers, my father worked as a machinist in a plant, and my mother sold cosmetics. My father would send his resume out day after day after day and get rejection after rejection after rejection. Till one day, a recruiter told him, you know what, why don't you change your name? Why don't you change your name from Mukun to Mike? And my father did, and he got a job. Every night, no matter how tired my dad was, he would sit me on his lap and he would read to me about Dr. King, Mahatma Gandhi, Eleanor Roosevelt. And I knew then that when I grew up, 
I wanted to give back to this nation, this nation that had literally saved my parents' life. So at age 33, I decided to do that. And I ran for Congress in a New York City Democratic primary against an 18-year incumbent because I thought that that was a great idea. <laughs> I had like a 1% chance of winning a thousand page policy book. I remember the only thing my friends and I knew how to do was build a website and we built one. And we raised like $50,000 from Indian aunties that were just so happy an Indian girl was running. <laughs> and it was the best experience of my life. And I lost miserably. I was broke, humiliated. I had pissed off everybody in the Democratic establishment. But when I went to bed that night in my victory party that never ended up happening, the faces that I kept seeing over and over and over again were actually the ones that I had never met on the campaign trail. Because you see, as the, as the members of Congress who are in this room understand, when you run for office, you end up going into a lot of schools. And I would go into computer science classes and robotics labs, and I'd see hundreds of boys clamoring to be the next Steve Jobs or Mark Zuckerberg. And I thought to myself, where are the girls? And this question of where are the girls started as a question and became my obsession because it didn't make sense to me. At a time where women are the majority in college, the majority in the labor force, where are we in this industry that is literally shaping our collective future? And it also didn't make sense to me as a daughter of immigrants, as a, someone who has benefited from opportunity, because I knew that, we're, that there were 500,000 open jobs in computing and tech, and that we had only graduated 40,000 computer science graduates compared to China, which graduated 350,000 engineers. And I also knew that our families were changing, that 45% of the breadwinners in our country were women, and that it's women in towns and parishes that put food on the table and pay for the mortgage. So why were they disappearing from this industry? And I realized, well, it wasn't always this way. In the 1980s, almost 40% of computer science majors were women, and today that number is less than 18%. If you were a cynic, you would think that as an industry becomes more powerful, we push women out. So the failed politician, the non-coder, oh yeah, I don't code, decided to do something about it. And I started an organization called Girls Who Code to offer free programs to girls after school and over the summer to teach them to get a shot at the American dream. And five years later, we've reached 40,000 girls in all 50 states. And as much as I am a feminist with a capital F, I do not believe in gender parity for the sake of gender parity. I believe that when we teach girls to code, we give them a shot to march up into the middle class, and we make sure that there is no innovation that will ever be left on the sidelines. And I see this every day. I see this in Jasmine who lives in California, Oakland. Her mother works at Burger King, single mom, family of four. Every day, Jasmine would take two buses and two trains to go from her house to Facebook to learn how to code. And in our program, you can build whatever you want. Jasmine decided to build an app called Wacky Words to teach kids SAT words because too many kids in her community, they wanted a shot at the American story but they didn't have money for fancy tutors and SAT classes. She built an app, not for herself, but to help others. I think about Courtney from Carrollton, Ohio. Father drives an oil rig. Carrollton has been decimated by the heroin epidemic. There's no Wi-Fi in the homes, no Wi-Fi in the schools, but still, every week, 40 girls meet in the local library to learn how to code, to get a shot at the American dream. The same look that I see in Courtney's father's eyes is the look that I saw in my father's eye. He would do anything and everything for me to have a shot at the American dream. This is possible. 
I feel blessed that we've had an opportunity to write a book because year after year after year, we have to turn girl, girls away. And I want to make sure that girls across the country have a shot to march up into the middle class. I also believe that in a moment where we feel that diversity is under attack, where we just recently learned about Katherine Johnson and the tremendous contribution that she had made to the history of computer science, and that most of you don't know who Ada Lovelace or Grace Hopper or the ENIAC women are, it is important now more than ever before to set the record straight, to make sure that girls see themselves in these future jobs, which is why I'm so proud in this book that not only do we talk about Catherine and Ada and Grace, we talk about Leela and Sophia, Leela who wears a hijab, Sophia who is Latina that has an abuela, Lucy who has braids and loves games. Every American girl can see themselves in the stories in our book. And I truly believe that through this, we can change the world one book and one girl at a time. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Diana Gabaldon. Thank you very much for being here tonight, and thanks for having me. Be relaxed, they said. Be casual, they said. <laughs> Do it in seven minutes, they said. <laughs> OK. Guten Abend, which some of you may know means good evening in German. And the reason I say that is because most of you have no idea how close we came to having everyone in this room know what that meant. Which is to say that at the time of the American Revolution, once it had succeeded and we had become a nation, Benjamin Franklin, who was one of the uh, sages of the revolution at that point, suggested to Congress that as so many of the citizens at that point were German, German should be the official language of the new United States. That uh, motion went to Congress, was voted on, it lost by one vote. <laughs> and uh, here we all are. Um, and from a, a variety of different places, my story sort of became the American story, uh, other than you know, the obvious about uh, who my parents, grandparents, et cetera, et cetera, were. That's much too long a story to tell you. Uh, the short form is that uh, when I once went to Germany to uh, do a book uh, tour, I was having lunch with the Germans, and uh, they said, well, how did you come to write these books? And I, I told them. And they were shocked, shocked, you know, to hear that I had thrown away a perfectly good PhD in science. I have a PhD in uh, quantitative behavioral ecology, which is just animal behavior with a lot of statistics. Don't worry about it. Uh, <laughs> my dissertation was entitled Nest Site Selection in the Pinion J, Gymnorhinus cyanocephalus. <laughs> or, as my husband says, why birds build nests where they do, and who cares anyway? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, the Germans were still more shocked to find that I had not only thrown away a PhD and 12 years of uh, a career as a successful scientist, but that I had not then gone back to school and got a degree in how to write a novel. Uh, and as they said to me, they said, no one in Germany would dare to write a novel without first getting a PhD in literature. And I said, that's probably why two-thirds of your catalog are American authors. <clears throat> Actually, I didn't say that because I have better manners than that, but, um, but it's true. <laughs> the thing is, as I was talking to uh, Scott Turow before dinner, and we were agreeing that the only way to learn to write is to write. And that was what I thought when I started writing a novel. So the question was, what was I going to write? And having thought for a while, I said, the easiest thing to write seems to be historical fiction. Because I was a research professor. I knew my way around a library. I said, it seems easier to look things up than to make them up. And if I turn out to have no imagination, I can steal things from the historical record. 
uh, so when I began, I uh, said, where shall I set this book? I've got no background in anything in particular. Uh, one time would do as well as another. I'll have to look it all up anyway. So I was looking for a time and place, and I happened to see a really old Doctor Who rerun on public television. Um, I gather some of you are familiar with Doctor Who. Yes, well, he is a time lord from the planet Gallifrey who travels through space and time having adventures and picks up companions from different periods of Earth's history. Well, in this particular show, he had picked up a young Scotsman from 1745. This was a nice 19, 20-year-old young man who appeared in his kilt. I said, well, that's kind of fetching. And uh, <clears throat> I found myself still thinking about this the next day in church, and I said, um, <laughs> well, you know, it doesn't really matter where you set this book, so you need to start somewhere. Why not Scotland, 18th century? So that's where I began, knowing nothing about Scotland or the 18th century, having no plot, no outline, and no characters. <laughs> nothing but the rather vague images conjured up by the notion of a man in a kilt, <laughs> which is, of course, a very powerful and compelling image, as um, all of the ladies here could tell you. Um, going back to the Germans, uh, one of my later books was quite lucky, and I won the uh, Corina International Prize for Fiction and had to go to Germany to accept it, which is very cool. But the German publisher had me interviewed during that week by everybody in the um, German media, and toward the end of this very tiring week, I was talking to a nice gentleman from a literary magazine. He said, well, I've read all of your works. They're tremendous. Your narrative drive is terrific. Your characters are so uh, three-dimensional. Three and I'm thinking, yes, yes, go on. And uh, <clears throat> instead, he stopped and said, uh, um, there's just this one thing I wonder. Can you explain to me what is the appeal of a man in a kilt? Well, I was very tired, or I might not have said it, but I looked at him for a minute, and I said, well, I suppose it's the idea that you could be up against a wall with him in a minute. <laughs> so, <laughs> you may be wondering <laughs> what this has to do with the American story. <laughs> but it actually has quite a lot to do with it. Which is to say that, in fact, not only did I not get a PhD in literature, the only thing that I knew about writing books when I began to write this novel was that they should have conflict. That was the sum total of, you know, 12 hours of English literature in college. And so it seemed to be enough. Anyway, I went to, to the library looking for conflict in Scotland in the 18th century. Well, you don't do that for very long without running into Bonnie Prince Charlie and the Jacobites. And so that became the material for my first book and, again, for the second book. I was only going to write this book for practice. I wasn't going to show it to anyone or tell anyone what I was doing, but things happened. And I had an agent before I finished it, and I told him, I think there's more to this story, but I thought I should stop while I could still lift it. And he said, okay. And so he told them that. Luckily, several people did want to buy it. And they said, trilogies are very popular these days. Do you think she could write three? Being a good agent, he said, oh, I'm sure she could. And um, so I got a three-book contract and proceeded with the Jacobite re Revolution and the Rebellion. Well, as you may know, the, uh, the Highland Scots lost that one big time. And as a result, many, many, many of them came to the Americas, most of them involuntarily. And uh, here they rested. So at the time of the American Revolution, one colonist out of every three was a Scot. And we have several of them as signers of the Declaration and so forth. Now, people reading my books, at the end of the second book, they got the third book and said, what is this? It's not in Scotland. And I said, no, didn't you notice? They lost at the end of the last book. You know? <laughs> and uh, they said, but we want to read about Scotland. And I said, well, tough. The story went you know, across the ocean. Now we're in America. So uh, that's where the story has developed over the next six books and so forth. And I became uh, increasingly interested in how many different people contributed to the American story at this point in time. We're working our way through the several years of the American American Revolution, and we're dealing with Quakers and Moravian Germans and non-Moravian Germans, and with the uh, the Gales from the Highlands, the Lowland Scots, also uh, with uh, the, with the Africans who were there, most of them involuntarily as well. Interestingly enough, the uh, Highlanders and the uh, the Africans had much in common, both being um, involuntarily there, many of them being in servitude, but also there was quite a lot of cultural overlap, in part owing to the music and the songs that they had. You will find uh, something called call and response singing in, uh, in African-American early music, which has contributed to American jazz. 
What's interesting is that you will find that very same thing amongst Gaelic Highlanders who had never seen Africa and evidently came up with it on their own. The other interesting thing is that uh, as the Gales came as, uh, as an in indentured servitudes, uh, still they, uh, they were white, which was kind of an advantage at the time, and therefore they were in some cases made overseers of the, of the uh, other slaves, I count them as slaves as well, on plantations and the like. And the interesting thing was that many of the, uh, of the black people there learned to speak Gaelic because their overseers spoke Gaelic. And we were therefore treated to such scenes as newly arrived people coming in from the highlands uh, being met by, um, by black uh, inhabitants on the docks and hearing them speak Gaelic, which their response was, my God, man, what happened to you? The sun must be terrible. <laughs> yeah. And uh, the thing is that there is this cross-fertilization always. Um, from the very beginning. Um, several members of my family uh, fought in the American Revolution on both sides, as well as being German mercenaries. My father's side of the family had uh, landed in Santa Fe in 1705, so they kind of sat that one out. But, uh, you know, I have always uh, enjoyed what we call hybrid vigor, which means that we derive our gene pool and our cultural fascination from all different, uh, different kinds of places. And, uh, the languages, too, have can, uh, contributed to this. I heard someone say that um, English is a language that chases other languages down a dark alley, knocks them over, and goes through their pockets for loose grammar. <laughs> and this is pretty much true. <laughs> However, <clears throat> as, uh, as Ms. Shetterly said earlier, uh, the roots of our language, of our revolution, of our culture, go back to England and the, the elegant language of the 18th century. Washington and Jefferson um, made as much of an impact as they did, in part because of what they said, as well as, uh, as what they meant by it. And uh, so uh, we kind of beat Germany out by a bit and became a, a nation of English speakers. The funny thing is that uh, a lot of the philosophy of the American Revolution arose from uh, English club men, and um, this is where they got their socialization. They all belonged to societies, some of which were philosophical, some of which studied literature, some of which had other views in mind, such as the Anacreontic Society, whose goal was drinking. And uh, they had a, uh, a particular song <clears throat> that they sang at each one of their meetings, which ended with, Besides, I'll instruct you, like me, to entwine the myrtle of Venus with Bacchus's vine, which is the 18th century equivalent of let's all get drunk and have sex. <laughs> Most of you will be more familiar with it in its later incarnation. Oh, say does that star-spangled banner yet wave O'er the land of the free and the home of the brave. And the moral of that is, the words matter. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome David McCullough. What a wonderful night and how privileged we all are to be here. I just look at these fabulous words up here, Library of Congress, National Book Festival. Think of what is entailed in just those words, that we have a Library of Congress, that we have a National Book Festival. And to take part in it as one of the writers is for me a very high privilege, and I am pleased to say that I've been involved with this event since its beginning in 2001, and it proved it with all the enthusiasm I can of keeping it going, and keeping it going indefinitely. And I want to say thank you to Dr. Hayden, 
and all of those who work with you for the marvelous contribution you make, you of the staff of the Library of Congress, to our country and to its betterment in so many ways. I have been devoting my working life to the American story for over 50 years. And I'm, I'm ever grateful that I somehow had the good fortune to wander in the, into this way of life, this way of contributing what I can to the, to the betterment of our country. I've done this on paper, I've done it in classrooms, I've done it on television and on the stage, and in every way I can to convey that history isn't about boring statistics and quotations and memorizing dates. It isn't about just politics and the military. History is human. It is, it is about people. When in the course of human events, our declaration begins. And the operative word there is human. And I've had wonderful responses from readers and television viewers and students that I've lectured in, to in, country, in colleges and universities all over the country. And the compliments I take very much to heart, including one that happened in the most unexpected way just two years ago in Boston where we had that horrendous blizzard series of nine feet of snow in a matter of about a month or less. It was a blizzard every two or three days with brief intervals where we could try to get out to get food, to get provisions to survive. Rosalie and I were living in Back Bay at the time and we would make up a list and I would go over or she would go over, we'd both go to get what we needed. And one particularly bad series of storms hit and we got up a list of everything we needed and I went over when the break came in the, in the weather and the, the star market in Back Bay was just a madhouse of people trying to get enough to, to get by. And it was as if the Russians were in Rhode Island or something. And, <laughs> And, um, and I got everything on the list except the, the cashews. <laughs> and as you know, you can't survive without cashews. <laughs> so I saw a fellow walking by with a star market uh, label on his shirt. And I said, excuse me, could you please help me to find the cashews? He said, yes, follow me. So I followed him and we went around a few bends. And there it was, the whole uh, peanut and nut department. And I got my cashews. And about seven minutes later, I was checking out the cash register. And this same fellow came up to me. And he said, excuse me, I don't mean to bother you, but that voice, your voice, were you by any chance the narrator of Ken Burns' Civil War series? <laughs> and I said, yes, I was. And he said, well, I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart. Because when that series first came on the air, I was suffering terribly from insomnia. <laughs> he said, I'd hear your voice and go right out. <laughs> so I hope very much I won't have that effect on all of you tonight. I found my vocation here in the Library of Congress. I had wanted to be a writer. I'd gone to Yale University and I'd been majored in English. I thought maybe I'd like to be like Thornton Wilder, who was then part of the faculty there, and uh, write plays, or certainly if not plays, novels. I had no expectation whatsoever of writing biography or history. When I got out of college, I couldn't make up my mind whether I wanted to be an actor or an architect or a writer or a painter. And I thought, I know what I'll do. I'll go to New York and something will happen. So I went to New York <laughs> and I wound up working for Time and Life for six years, six and a half years, and learned a hell of a lot about writing and about getting work done and getting it done on time. And then Kennedy was running for president and when he called on people 
in his inaugural address to do something for your country. I took that entirely to heart, quit my job, came down here to Washington, and wound up working for the U.S. Information Agency under Edward R. Murrow. It was a very exciting time, not only because we were working for Murrow, but we were working in the new, on the new frontier. And I was put in charge of a magazine for the Arab world, and I had a very limited budget, which I had to keep, make work. And one of the ways I discovered that could be done was to search out the resources for free material, principally photographs. The, ma the magazine was called Al, -Hal Al Hayat the America, Life in America. It was based on Life magazine, sold on the newsstands. And I came up to the Library of Congress to try and find wonderful material that we could use in the magazine. It was free. And while I was here working one day, I passed I was in the, depart the Department of ph ph Photographs. I w went by a table, and on the table was this wonderful assortment of photographs taken by a photographer who had gotten into Johnstown, Pennsylvania within days after the terrible, disastrous flood of 1889. And I'd grown up in Pittsburgh, and I'd heard about the Johnstown flood all my life, and it, but I didn't know anything about it. All I knew was that when we were kids, we used to put a lake of gravy in the mashed potatoes, and then we'd break the potatoes with our fork, and as the gravy came down into the peas, we'd say, the Johnstown flood. <laughs> and I looked at these photographs, and I said, what? in the world happened. I couldn't believe the devastation. Now keep in mind, that was the worst man-made disaster, but man and nature made disaster that had ever hit the country until then. Over 2,500 people died. It's as many as died at the tower in New York uh, at 9-11. And, at and I got interested in it, and I took a book out of the library, this library, and it wasn't very good. It, the author didn't seem to understand the geography of Western Pennsylvania. I at least knew that. So I took another book out, and it was a pot boiler written at the time. It was very inaccurate, and I thought, no. That's... So when I was in college, Thornton Wilder would, would, was asked, uh, how do you come up with the idea to write the plays and the novels you've written? And he said, I imagine a story that I would like to see produced on stage or to read in a book. And if I can't find that, I write it so I can read it, or I write it so I can see it performed on stage. So I said to myself, why don't you write, try to write, the book about the Johnstown flood that you would like to read? And in effect, that's what I've been doing with every subject I've undertaken since I began this work. I had never done historic research, I had never taken anything more of history than what was required when I was an undergraduate. I have no graduate degrees. And I've never thought of myself as an historian. I'm called an historian, and I'm always complimented by that. But I'm a writer. I'm a writer writing what really happened as best I can. And because of a lot of writing I'd done in college, in the courses I took, and writing that I'd done at Time in Life, I realized you have to understand the people. Who was involved? What were they like? What were they thinking? How were they raised? Where did they come from? Uh, what were their problems, internally or externally? Or, and what were the adversities they faced? History is about people. And because I was in Washington during the Kennedy years, Kennedy, as many of you may remember or know, was asked about what he was reading, and he was reading uh, Barbara Tuckman's The Guns of August. So I went out right away and got Barbara Tuckman's Guns of August, and I thought, whoa, this is the kind of history book I'd like to read more of. So I began reading people like Bruce Catton and others, and I realized that writers can write history. And Barbara Tuckman, in one of her essays about writing history, said there's no secret to writing history or teaching history, tell stories. The American story, which has hardly been even half told so far. 
For one thing, too much attention has been focused on politics and the military. Yes, politics and the military are of the utmost importance, but they by no, but by no means are the human story. That involves poetry, music, art, it involves science and medicine and finance, it involves luck. We never talk about how the part luck has played in history. And it involves individual human beings who made a difference. And what began to interest me particularly, once I had gotten into writing, as soon as I started doing the research for the Johnstown Flood, much of which I did here, I've done research for every one of my books here in the Library of Congress to a large degree or to a small but important degree. My book on the Wright Brothers was drawn almost entirely from the extraordinary, amazing collection of letters and diaries kept by the Wright Brothers and their mother and father and sister, all right here. And oh, could they write because their father raised them to express themselves in the English language as best possible. And he, he meant to express themselves on paper and on their feet. They never had even, even completed high school. And yet you read those letters here and you think, oh my goodness, the vocabulary, the use of the command of the language. And you realize we've got a lot of work to do just to catch up with what kind of high school and the kind of bringing up that those young men experienced. They lived in a house that had no running water, no indoor plumbing, no central heat, uh, no uh, telephone, but it was a house full of books because their father believed you had to read and you have to read above your level. So there were no children's books, they were all real books and they read all their lives. <laughs> I'm not in any way demeaning children's books. <laughs> they stick with you. Side Maisie, a lazy bird hatching her egg. I'm tired and I'm bored with kinks in my leg from sitting here, sitting here day after day. It's work how I hate it. I'd much rather play. <laughs> when I went to, when I first went, in grade school, we were told we could go and, and visit the school library and this was in kindergarten and we went in and oh boy were we thrilled and um, the, the librarian Miss Powell we all sat down at the, the, the little tables the librarian said now did you all bring your library shoes <laughs> meaning you're going to be quiet I thought, my mother didn't tell me I had to have library shoes and I, I felt so awful, I felt so insecure that I didn't have my library shoes. I can't come into the, any of these libraries without wondering whether I still have my library shoes on. <laughs> but the first book I got up and went over to the shelf to pick out was Horton Hatches the Egg, the one I just quoted. It sticks with you, it's important, it's part of growing up, it's part of discovery. I often think that the book that influenced me more than any other was a little engine that could, which has two lessons. You, you persevere, but also you work together. It's not just you're trying to do something alone. I, um, I've often wondered about why I do what I do and whether I have some weird ways of going about it. And I've been a little reluctant to talk about it openly until recently. And I thought, what the hell, admit it. <laughs> I've never undertaken a subject that I knew anything about. If I knew all about it, I wouldn't want to work on the book. To me, the, the writing, the research, the thinking that goes into the work is an adventure. It's working on a detective case. It's setting foot on a continent where I've never set foot in my life. And I, I've loved that part of the adventure. I also have felt very strongly that I wanted to give some people who don't get sufficient credit, credit for the first time. Bring them back, bring them on stage, downstage, center stage with the lighting on them and bring some of these seemingly peripheral people up to the front and center stage too, like Abigail Adams or Emily Roebling, the wife of the great engineer of the Brooklyn Bridge. And to and to point out to all of us, we can't forget these people. John Adams, 
always upstaged by the two tall Virginians on either side. But when you think of what John Adams did in his life, and that he was the only, the only founding father president who never owned a slave out of principle, he would not own a slave, nor would Abigail allow him to own a slave. And the first president after John Adams who have never owned a slave was their son, John Quincy Adams. Now that's not a minor attribute. The oldest constitution we have in our country is not our national constitution, it's the constitution of Massachusetts, and he wrote it. And in that constitution, there's a clause about the importance of education that applies as much today as it ever did then, and hopefully will always apply. I felt very strongly that the Wright brothers, for example, we would learn in the high school, though the first airplanes, motor powered plane to be flown was flown by the Wright brothers at Kitty Hawk and it was 193 and it was changed the world. Well, what about them? What were they like? How did they grow up? What did they believe? Well, one thing they believed was to have, to have purpose in life. Don't just go along thinking that it's all about material acquisitions or getting a lot of property or becoming famous or something. No, have purpose. And modesty, you remember modesty? <laughs> the Wright brothers never bragged a word about what they achieved. The Wright brothers never said anything derogatory about their rivals, never, because that was the way they were raised. And to be loyal and to be honest, to tell the truth. And it's the way many of us, most of us, I like to think, were raised. And we still believe that. And we also still believe that our story as a country is a story of progress. It doesn't always come easily. It doesn't always come instantly. It isn't always apparent right away, but it is progress. When I was working on my book about Johnstown, I spent a lot of time in Johnstown, and I heard about the engineer who helped bring the uh, Bessemer system to the steel mills in Johnstown very early, one of the earliest mills in the country to develop the Bessemer process. And this fellow was always working on developing new machinery, new equipment, new devices. And his famous line was, after they'd been working for months and months on a new piece of machinery, he'd say, all right, boys, let's start her up and see why she doesn't work. <laughs> That's what we're about. It's called the empirical me method. You, do, you try something and if it doesn't work, you study why it doesn't work, and then you fix it. And then maybe eventually it will work. And it's been true all along. And we are constantly making progress, which we don't recognize as progress because we're in the thick of it, we're in the midst of it, as everybody always was. When you think, for example, of what's happened in our country, in our lifetime, in medicine, it's utterly phenomenal. I think that future historians may very well, looking back on our time, say to themselves, well, that's what the real history was then. That was the history being made. And it comes from ideas. It comes from education. It comes from imagination and genius. Yes, it does happen because some people really have that touch of genius and they should be part of history. Those doctors whose names don't figure at all, we should know exactly who they were and who they, what they did. Just as it's true about our painters and our writers, I thank my lucky stars that I quit my job in New York and came to this city when I did. It not only changed my outlook, it changed my life, but it's, it's given me an ambitions to expand the experience of being alive through the experience of history, through the experience of our story in a way that probably would never have happened had I not taken that step and that venture. And every time I come into this library, 
I thank goodness we live in a society, in a country, that puts the library on our Acropolis right here with our capital, because that's the way it should be. That's how we should feel about it. And I, I know we all have favorite libraries in our hometowns or where we grew up, but this is one of the miracles of the American story, this great Library of Congress. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.